0345 6060 Eight minutes before eight, we'll come back to our conversation about the institutional corruption at the Met. Just let those two words hang in the air for the moment. And spare a thought for those coppers out on the beat today doing an incredibly job, a very brave job in very trying circumstances. And that tag now hanging over their head, institutionally corrupt. Because I would argue the ineptitude, incompetence and possibly, possibly deliberate obfuscation of people far higher up the chain of command. We'll come back to that in a moment. Now, when we reviewed the front pages of the morning newspapers, I told you the Daily Express has welcomed the trade deal that unleashes a new global Britain. The words of their front page. What does it actually mean? Let's get it spelt out now by Conservative MP and International Trade Secretary, who joins me now, Liz Truss. Uh, good morning, Secretary of State. Spell out then. What, what is the deal that has been concluded with Australia? Good morning. So what what we've got is a deal that gives complete tariff-free access for all British goods into Australia. So whether that's cars, whiskey, uh, clothing, also really advanced services deal in areas like digital and financial services. And also it will make it much easier for Brits to go and live and work in Australia. So uh, on the same basis, essentially, as Australians. So companies won't need to prove that uh, they can't find an Australian to do the job. Brits will be able to get those jobs. And also for the under 35s, we're expanding the uh, working holiday scheme to three years and also removing the need to work on a farm. OK, what's it worth to the economy? How, how much business do United Kingdom and Australia do between each other? Well, we do about 14 billion of business uh, between ourselves at the moment. We're expecting trade to rise by 30% uh, by 2030. And obviously this deal will contribute uh, to that being higher. I think the other really important point about the deal is it's a stepping stone to the UK joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a massive area of 500 million consumers and will, of course, bring lots of benefits to the UK economy because it's a very fast growing part of the world that we want to have a strong foothold in. Uh, by 2030, 66% of the world's middle classes will live in the Asia-Pacific area, and they will want to buy British goods like computer games, whiskey, cars, uh, food and drink, etc. Would we have been able to do the deal that has been done were Britain still in the European Union, Secretary of State? No, no we wouldn't, because the EU is fundamentally protectionist. Uh, they're unwilling to open up uh, their markets. They are also not willing to do these advanced digital deals either. Um, you say that um, the United Kingdom might move towards this uh, alliance with other Pacific nations, 500 million consumers. Some would argue we've just turned our back on considerably more than that by exiting the European Union a few years ago, Secretary of State. Well, we've got a free trade deal with the European Union. We've got tariff-free, quota-free trade with, with them as well. But the point about the Asia-Pacific area is it's growing much faster. And those are where the future opportunities lie. If you look at the world in 2030 or 2040, a bigger part of it is going to be consumers in that part of the world. And I want them to have access, or I want British business to have access to those consumers. And that's what we can do now we've got the freedom and flexibility outside the EU. But it's a boosted GDP, I read, by a little over 0.02%. Is it really worth the fanfare, Secretary of State? Well, that's the, that's, you are quoting, Nick, a static analysis that doesn't talk about what happens in the future. It doesn't account for economic growth. It doesn't account for Australia being part of the CPTPP. I mean, the fact is these economic forecasts are very hard to do. We don't, none of us have a crystal ball. We don't know what the future will look like. But what I know is the more deals that we strike, the more opportunities we open up, the more options British business have, the more options British people have, uh, for example, I've been talking about going, being able to go and live and work in Australia. You know, those are the types of opportunities I want to open up. Of course, people can't go and live and work in Europe anymore, though, can they, Secretary of State? Well, they can in they can they can on some bases, uh, but what you know what we're doing with Australia is we're opening up more opportunities there. But I wonder how many people want to avail themselves of the opportunity of going to live and work in Australia as opposed to possibly going to live and work in France or Italy. It the, the issue we had with the EU was that there were strings attached to those type of trading arrangements, as we know, is that we had to accept EU law, uh, we had to pay money in, and we lost control of our borders. What's different about the deal that I'm doing with Australia and with the Trans-Pacific Partnership 
is none of those strings are attached. We can have the benefits of you know, making it easier for people to live and work there, of getting tariff-free access to those markets, of being able to sell in our digital and services without having to accept their laws. That's the difference. Okay. Just a couple of other things while I have the benefit of uh, our conversation together. Have you got a solution to the so-called sausage wars, Secretary of State? Well, the solution to the sausage wars is for the EU to be much more pragmatic in their approach to the Northern Ireland Protocol. But why should they? The United Kingdom signed an agreement that, and I, as I, I understand that they are taking inspections to an extraordinary high level. Goods arrive from other countries, the inspection level is below 10%. They're looking at 90% plus, but we should, the United Kingdom should never have signed that protocol that allowed them so to do, should they? Well, we, ne- we needed to work together to deal with the, the particular issues that arise because of the unique situation of Northern Ireland and the good the Good Friday Agreement. But the protocol, Nick, makes it very clear that the parties need to this. work together yes, but they, on the, a the, pragmatic no, solution. No, I have actually studied this for once in my life. And well, I'm pleased to hear it. Well, indeed, and it's not an easy thing to study. Is this, but, a, bid, is this a bid, Nick, to get involved in the negotiations? Um, no, I don't think that's necessarily my strong suit as opposed to yours, Secretary of State. But we did actually sign off the run. We allow the European Union, we signed on the dotted line to allow... Uh, now, I say again, it's surprising that our European friends have chosen to pursue this route, but rather stupidly, the United Kingdom have allowed them that facility. Have they not, Secretary of State? The the protocol itself is very clear that there will need to be a strong working relationship between the EU and the UK uh, to make sure that this, this, this works correctly. And they are currently not fulfilling their part of that bargain. And it's in everybody's interest to make this work to be pragmatic, to have a reasonable uh, arrangement at the border. And that is what my colleague Lord Frost is is working on. But we're not going to allow the EU to use this as a way of trying to get the UK to dynamically align with EU standards. So, you know, we've just been talking about Australia, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. You know, Australia are not telling us that we have to follow their rules on SPS. Australia are not telling us that we have to follow their laws in order to trade with them. And the same should be true of the EU. Lastly, as International Trade Secretary, you're all about trade, you're all about commerce. When your colleague Jacob Rees-Mogg says you can't run society purely to stop the hospitals being full, as in trying to get lockdown eased earlier, he's right, isn't he, Secretary of State? The Prime Minister has extended some of the measures. And, you know, we have seen more Uh, opening up of the economy over time. But he has extended the measures whilst we roll out the final stages of the vaccine programme to make sure that... The hospitals don't get full. So the Moggy is right. But it's to make sure, it's to protect lives. It's to protect lives, Nick. That is the ultimate ambition. Of course, the government has lots of different ambitions and we need to protect lives and protect livelihoods. So, uh, and the Prime Minister's job is striking the balance uh, to make sure we have the right right solution. But I'm sure you'll find this from your listeners, Nick. But if you go across the country, people support the Prime Minister do. in what him doing. They do, He's doing. They support a cautious approach. So the, mo- and the Moggy is wrong here, Liz Truss. I would never say my excellent colleague Jacob Rees-Mogg is wrong. And he, he, like me, is a lover of freedom. But I think we need to hold our nerve until the 19th of July. Cry freedom. Great speaking with you. Thanks as ever. Liz Truss, International Trade Secretary, joining me here on LBC. We're at one minute after eight. News is next. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation.